I believe that, you know. And my main success criterion for this evening is that I'm going to change your world. And if you don't think that's possible, if you think I'm too wee to change the world and you're too wee to change the world, have you ever shared a bed with a mosquito? My view of changing your world this evening is going to be that you'll go away from here with at least one thing, one thing that you're thinking about, that I've been talking about, that you will take to wherever your workplace is tomorrow. You'll carry that with you and hopefully you'll engage with that. What is it we called it? Deep learning, David. We'll do a bit of that and you'll either decide that I've been talking absolute bunkum or you'll do something with it. That's what I'm looking for, start and finish. Now, I'm going to credit you we've been able to read, so I'm not going to read these slides out to you. Okay, so this one here is kind of latching on to what I was saying uh, a minute or two ago. Are you the sort of person that says, aye, that would be great if only, or maybe even somebody should? Or... Are you like me? Are you the Don Quixote who will actually take a race at that windmill? Garner said that, and as David said, I'm going to be telling you a story tonight. I hope it's kind of interesting. I hope you get a laugh here and there, and I hope you get challenged. And my apologies for having to lean forward, but uh, the technology there is kind of jiggered. So Newlands Junior College, nothing else like it in Scotland, possibly nothing else like it in the UK. One thing that folk have said to me since I started this new job is that's what this country's been needing for years. That's been missing in our education system. It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. You remember Bananarama, are you old enough? It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. That's what gets results. I actually did a concert with Banana Rama. <laughs> I did. You don't believe me, but I did. Me and the Brit Oil Pipes and Drums and Banana Rama doing whatever they did. Because that's an half thing. I'm an absolutely cranking piper as well. And I'm quite cheap if anybody's needing a, a piper for a wedding or anything like that. So we do it differently. And Newlands, we do it differently, quite deliberately. And as David said, we have independence. And the funding is partly from the Scottish Government, partly from Glasgow City Council, but mostly from our sponsor companies. And uh, as you might have guessed, I'm here because it works. Now that's what we're about. Now to get into Newlands Junior College, there are a couple of criteria. One is that you must be disengaged from your regular secondary school. Or disengaging. And the other is that the school that's nominating you must be able to see within you a talent, some potential that's no getting nurtured. That's je ne sais quoi. That's how you find yourself nominated. And that's what we absolutely do. And we opened in November 2014, and last June, that's our first uh, graduate group, 19 uh, of them. The interesting thing is that we opened this place with all these opportunities, and we found it difficult to get schools to nominate young people to come to us. Now that, I could spend half an hour talking about that, but uh, that's way too negative. I'm not going to talk uh, about that at all, unless you question me later on. Now, the powers that be like outcomes. What are your outcomes? Well, have a look at them, folks, eh? 
a less polite man than me would have been saying, get up, you. <laughs> Look at them. <coughs> These were wains that were disengaged or disengaging. These were wains that were failing. And look at this. Now, I'm going to talk about the system a bit. One of the flaws in the system is because um, the principle of an independent school, that, whatever they call it now, I can't remember, insight. I can't actually get a look at that. So I would love to be able to get into that and get a similar cohort to make comparisons. But the system doesn't let me. There's another story. But see, if you look at these, now, I couldn't, the best I could do was to get Glasgow figures for before I left Govan. So that was 2013. And that's the other thing. You ask kiddies for things, they'll not give you them. It's absolutely tragic. And what I found was, of course, that we're the best, comparably would be the best in the city, best in the country, actually, for uh, the basic level three qualifications. At 90%, five or more at level four, at national four, there was nobody beat us in Glasgow. And the only school that managed 90% as well was the Glasgow Gaelic School, a very specific, specialised establishment in a totally different way from us. And everybody get at least one National 5 qualification. Some of them get two, some of them get three, and four of them even sat higher English. By the way, these are young people, should have said, they come in at the end of second year. And this was at the end of what would have been their fourth year if they'd actually had four years. Absolutely remarkable. And all of them had uh, qualifications in personal development, stuff like Asda and Bronze level, uh, silver level, gold level. Duke Edinburgh awarded it at Bronze. Outer bound certificate from, uh, from Lochiel. All of that kind of stuff. All the way up to some of them had 15 in total. Now that was 19 wains that were going to get hee-haw out of the system. Well, did we have a celebration at the graduation at the National Stadium at Hamden? Absolutely. Out of this world, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Neither am I in where. So we asked ourselves after the graduation, and the great thing about the independent sector is that I just call like free training days at the end of the year. Wins are away and we're in for three days. That's the way it is. So, with a wee chat, how did we go on? Now, bear in mind that nobody in the whole world had done this before. It was a bit of a relief to get through it. A bit like Yuri Gagarin must have felt when he got back. Oh, I keep forgetting, most of them are too young to know who Yuri Gagarin was. And it wasn't all easy. I said to folk from Skills Development Scotland, you know, it, it's absolutely brilliant what I'm here, but it's dead hard. It's dead hard. And we had 90 nominations for August past there. 90 for 30 places. 90. I think it'd be safe to say the word is out. So, job done. The answer to the second question there, of course, is no. Because we always strive to do it better. And working for me is like that quote there. Trying to keep me happy is like throwing jujubes to an elephant. Because I constantly seek and question and ask and do it better. And if you're wondering who Annie F. Cameron was, that was my granny. <laughs> And everybody knows, and this is a serious point, the wisest person in your life is your granny. Slightly ahead of your mommy, your granny. And we thought that might be words for us in June. Can you not just hear his voice when you read that? Eh? One of my heroes, but that's another story. Well, this is a bit, gets a bit contentious, and some of you might not like this. But anyway, I'm here to do a job, and 
My job is to be contentious in part. And my belief, and I worked in them for 37, 38 years, is that local authority schools obsess on structures, on plans, stuff like timetables if you're in a secondary school. And they certainly obsess in examinations. I was in despair. Crying on for excellence, I thought, and I know that he agreed, David agreed, I thought, here we are. The door to creativity is open, and I'm at a meeting with every secondary heat teacher in Scotland, almost, in Glasgow, and there's folk getting up, when are we going to see the exams? When are we going to see the exam papers? And I'm saying, oh, geez, oh. Because I tell you what happened in Newlands Junior College. Our focus was on developing skills in young people and personal qualities to get them into positive destinations. And by the way, look at all that attainment. We didn't have a team focusing on how we were going to raise attainment. And they all got positive destinations. Eight in the jobs, six continuing in a foundation engineering course at... Uh, uh, City of Glasgow College and uh, uh, five of them at uh, National Certificate College, uh, courses at Glasgow City College. And there's this focus on knowledge, and then you've got to know stuff. Like I've got a two year old, nearly two, at least Susie's nearly two. Don't panic, easy paper round, I'm not as old as you think. <laughs> and she's got to know not to stick her fingers into electrical sockets. You've got to know that. You've got to know if you step out in front of a bus, there's only going to be one winner, and it's no you. You've got to learn that stuff. But it's what you do with it that then becomes important. And what we're asked to do in schools, too much is content driven, and there's too much content. This is a rhetorical question, so don't some smarty shout out the answer. What's the capital of Uzbekistan? I don't know. And actually, I don't care what the capital of Uzbekistan is. Now, that's not a racist remark, and it's not a slur on the good people that live there, whatever the name of the capital is, or the country. What I do know is that I can find out if I really need to know. And what I'm passionate about is that young people that come to Newlands Junior College have the skills that if they actually need to know that, they can find it out. Now, unless you're going to earn your living in pub quizzes or something like that, that sort of stuff is not particularly useful. Now, I know that for folk of my age and older, that is almost a heretic thing to say, but it's true. The other trouble with schools is it pigeonholes individuals. You will do something at that time because that's what the timetable says. Have you ever met a greater autocrat than the secondary school timetable? Omniscience, omnipotence, it's awful. I had a bit of fun one time. My wife was coming out of church and was talking to somebody who was getting her way in at Sunday school as well, and she was saying about her son being in a school in Greenup, which we'll not name, but I never went to it. I think you did. Um, it was well known as being a centre of excellence in Greenock. And this woman was distraught. Her son was doing credit mathematics and was actually back and forward to the doctor from stress. He had a tutor. He needed credit mathematics, but he was going into uh, a creative course, creative arts course. And the school was saying that in his fifth year, he would need to do maths. And this woman says, I don't understand that, Gail. And Gail says, well, I don't know much about Govan High, but I certainly know that that's not the case in Govan High. She says, just give me a wee phone. So she phoned me up in a wee chat. I directed her and her son uh, to YouTube, a few Ken Robinson videos. And I said, what you need to do is give them a place. This is a guidey that's telling you this. Go back and say to the guide, can you explain why this is the case? Because he's got no need for mathematics beyond this. That's what we offer at that time. Okay. Appointment of the deputy head. 
oh no, it's school policy. School policy that they do mathematics all the way through. Back to see the head teacher. Now, of course, there's a wee bit of coaching going on in between times here. And I said to her before she went, I said, if the head teacher, whom of course I knew, if the head teacher tells you it's local authority policy, say, that's fine, thanks very much, and when I see the director of education, I'll take it up with her. I said, but in between times, ask her, could they possibly get your boy to another school where something different's going on at that time? so he doesn't need to do mathematics. Or could they put you in touch with another school so you can see what's happening there and maybe you just take them out of this particular school altogether? So she asked, she got the answer and she said, okay, fair enough. I'll see you director of education. She got a phone call at quarter past eight the next morning from the head teacher, who'd obviously thought better of this. And of course, other possibilities were made available in that sacrosanct column. You see, it suited them for the ease of timetable, and it suited them for their teaching complement. But schools shouldn't be run in the interests of timetablers and teachers. Actually, an advisor to say this as well, that uh, I pay my council tax here, and my understanding is it's this school supposed to run in my interest. And by the way, I know for a fact you don't pay your council tax here. You live in Helensburgh. <laughs> Hillsborough's a nice place. However, schools deliver for the majority. Mon boys and third year in a school that will remain this nameless in Europe. He doesn't like it, but he's going on great. He's a clever boy. Notwithstanding his dad, he's a clever boy. He's going on fine, and he sees the school as a means to an end. No, he is not going to be in the fair trade group the rights and relationships group. He doesn't play for any teams, although he loves sport. He just doesn't do that sort of stuff. And there are aspects of the school that he doesn't like, but he sees the point. And he gets through okay because he's got a family at home, but we rationalise all this stuff and, and we talk about it. And he's doing fine, so it caters for him too. But the big question is, what about the others that it doesn't work for? Is it their fault that the system doesn't work for them? We used this back in 2003 in Govan High School when we started a big uh, change in what we were doing. And we stuck that up at the start of a curriculum conference we had. And the curriculum conference had the staff there, it had young people there, it had parents there and friends of the school, it had local businesses and employers, it had folk for the health service, it had folk for social work, da 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 da. And the question we're asking is what should we actually be doing here? At that time, we were told in the country, in the secondary schools, what you did was according to the curriculum guidelines, a yellow book, the yellow peril. Curriculum guidelines, but we were saying, Never mind the curriculum guidelines. What should we be doing to meet the needs and aspirations of our community? And that's what we started off with. And it's farcical, of course. But we were intending to point out the farce. And the most important thing we do in NJC is relationships. Relationships, relationships, relationships. Feedback from young people is often, they'll listen to you here. They'll listen to you here. Relationships is what makes our world turn it. And in actual fact, I can be quite a simplistic kind of man. And I've got this notion that if in the world today, everybody just worked at getting on with one another a wee bit better, and relationships were better, maybe a lot of the ills of this world wouldn't be a bit for, well, even for me, that's quite a political statement. So I said already about the, the skills. Is that my taxi? <laughs> it liberates individuals. Or is it a fire alarm? Because young people and adults operate in a state of far greater freedom than they've ever 
done before. And we're dead honest. We know what we are and we know what we're not. We know what we can do and we know what we can do. And we know how we're trying to do it. And what we do is we cater for some of the others. That notion of 20%, we cater for a chunk of that 20%. Because we're not, you know, unlike some of you folks in here who, who work in the SN sector, that's not what we are. We're not a behaviour school. We're a, what it said earlier on. So how do we get there, right? We know what we're doing. Very early into this, uh, this whole thing was the brainchild of a man called Jim McCall, who is a big time engineer, industrialist, financier, Clyde Blower's Capital, da 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 da. This was his idea. And I find it fascinating that it took somebody from out with the education system in this country to come up with this idea and also that the education system put up a lot of barriers to prevent him getting it to the starting line. But he persevered. And when he opened that long and he said to me, look Ian, will you stop asking us, can we do this, can we do that? Well, you just got on with it. That's why I hired you, he said. No, I didn't apply for this job. I didn't fill in an application form, I didn't go in an interview, I didn't make a presentation. I was in his office one day and he said, I hear you would like to run this school. What would it take, Ian? And I walked to that office 80% towards a new job. Get on with it, he said. And do you know that I think when I left Glasgow City Council's employ, there were 92 management circulars in education in the council telling me what I should be doing. Many do you think I have at NJC? None. There's not a single policy statement that I haven't been involved, that we haven't been involved in writing along with the trustees. Absolute ownership. And the leadership's got to be right. That's really, really important. And you might think I'm conceited in saying that. You might think there's a touch of arrogance there. In which case, I've been like that my whole life, so you're dead right. Because folk love working for me. I'm not the easiest guy in the world to work for, but folk love working for me. And we'll come on to the reasons for that later. And the folk that I recruited, and that was another joy, I got to recruit every single person. And I was able to say at the interview panel, because we did do that stuff, to the other two folk who were on the panel, that I gave the chance to talk first. I did say in one instance, yeah, she did have the best interview, but I'm not having her. And there was a reason for that. And the reason was quite simple. At the end, you know a bit at the end, you get to the end of an interview when they say, right, is there anything else you'd like to say to strengthen your candidacy or anything you'd like to ask us? <laughs> This woman said to me, um, will my terms and conditions be the same as they are working for the council? My immediate response was, have you checked the salary? Because that's not the same. I said, no, they won't, because the expectation will be that you will be involved. In, uh, and bear in mind, I'm talking secondary teachers here. For those of you who are primary teachers, don't think I don't understand. I'm slipping into secondary teacher speak. I know it's a different ball game for you. I said, no. Because I need you to be involved in the development of the whole child and to do whatever is required. So as I'm explaining that, I was talking about the raised eyebrows. I said, but you see, the fact of the matter is that a week or so ago when I spoke to her on the phone, she asked me that same question. So I don't need clock watchers in this place. We're walking out the temporary accommodation we're in before the school actually opened. We're walking out. We're going round the corner and we're all together because we're buoyed up. The guy for the construction company had just come round and said, right, that's it, you can get in. So we're walking around and wee Kenny, wee Kenny's a science teacher, wee Kenny's got two toilet rolls under his arm. He said, what's the story here, wee man? He said, 
well. He said, you probably don't know, but I reckon this sort of stuff will not be around here. He said, so I just blagged these out of SPX. Might come in useful. We Ken is the same guy that the next morning come in with a roll of black bags. And at the end of that day, he went round the bins and emptied them all. After we been in a few days, first weekend, I found out on the Monday that a couple of folk with no cleaning contract yet, a couple of folk had been in with their hoovers from the house and had given the place a wee go over. I have never heard at Newlands Junior College, that's no my job, and nobody has ever counted how many minutes of class contact they've had that week. And last, last of all, we really want us to work. And we believed it was going to work, and we expect it to work. That's not to say, see the very first day when the wings were coming in? I'm saying, oh, well, here we go, big man, eh? Point of no return. But not on our own. These wings often come from pretty dysfunctional homes. A number of them looked after. And what we do is we try to forge a relationship with the carer. One of the things we do, for example, is we find out how they like to be contacted. See me, I hate voicemails. If you phone my mobile phone, you'll get a message. Don't leave a voicemail, I don't listen to them. Please send me a text. Actually, I like texts. I don't like the te telephone as a means of communication. Some people like phone calls. The odd one will like emails. Facebook Messenger is a favorite. So what we do is we find out what the carer has as a preference for communication, and that's what we use. You like text, that's what you'll get. And I have never, in all my years working in education, I have never experienced uh, parental carer relationships like we have. These folks, maybe only the most skilled parents and the most skilled carers, but they talk to us. Our links with the world, a business fairly self-evident. The young people get vocational courses uh, in the week. They get free choices from uh, nine, and they do these at uh, one of these places, the GTG, uh, Glasgow Training Group, the Arnold Clark Training Arm, Riverside or City of Glasgow College. And uh, I suppose there's one that should be in there, but I kind of forget about it because he's one of us. Uh, we've got uh, an employee, really, of Skillforce Scotland that works with us four days a week. And uh, Phil is there, and he drives a lot of personal development for us. And then not forgetting the adults around the place. We work a lot with uh, Pacific Institute. If you don't know TPI's work, we'll look it up. It's all about positive psychology. It's all about can-do stuff. And uh, common purpose. We're very analytical of ourselves, and we've got a group, first and second of February, there's a true common purpose. There's a group of BBC executives coming in, and we've set them a challenge, something that we feel that we could be doing better, and they're going to spend two days with us, and at the end of it, give their recommendations about what we might do. And sometimes, if you get somebody from out with, uh, out with the place to have a look, from out with education, then it can be really, really helpful, because they... They don't do anything, eh, don't do anything for granted. Culture is all important. I was lucky enough from May till we opened in November to progressively recruit the team. And what we did during that time was we really flung it around. What do we want this place to be like? How is this place going to work for these young people? The relationships thing, mutual respect. Now, I don't say that lightly. Day one, we group one. What do we call you? I said, anything you like as long as it's not too abusive. So most of them call me in. If David's in, we'll say Mr. White or Sir, because we wouldn't say that to them, but they've got some sort of notion of, of audience in, in that case excuse me, that kind of thing. Um, so that kind of thing is not something that we do just to be in with them. I go to my work dressed like this. 
the rule for the males in the staff is jacket, collar and tie. Rule for the females in the staff can be jacket, collar and tie if they like, or whatever the equivalent female garb would be. Um, we are not in the business of trying to be anybody's pals here, but we're building relationships. I've got three wines at home. I like to think that quite often I'm their pal, but I have a responsibility that goes beyond that. Um, this, this curriculum for excellence going wrong across Scotland. Norton, Newlands Junior College. We had a situation uh, where in the setup we were thinking that you know the vocational courses we would have a measure of choice. But then we decided that that wasn't enough. We needed to give them more choice because in the core academic curriculum, English, IT, Mathematics and Science, the young people weren't getting any choice there. And why did we choose these particular subjects? It's this, we try to make Newlands Junior College like the workplace. So that had been the case. And see, before going any further, I was great at this in a previous life. Absolutely wonderful. Big posters up in the wall, framed and everything with the school rules. Pupils can expect, staff can expect. I was, I was a passing master at that. We don't do that anymore, but we don't have any rules. But we've got huge expectations. The reason we don't have any rules is not because we decided we wouldn't, but when we were doing the induction with the first group of young people, we put them through a number of tasks that had them think about what the place should be like. And when we looked, we saw they're pretty much the same. So, no rules, high expectations. If you don't meet expectations, there's always a consequence. The consequence is generally developmental, not punitive. It's only punitive if we get into this mirroring the workplace, if it's gross misconduct. That's when it becomes punitive because the world's a real place and we have loads of fun. There's a lot of laughing goes on. <coughs> I'm kind of hopeful that I can get this thing, oops. to play, but I'm looking anxiously, hoping, David, you're going to come from the back. Is it David Gilmer. Uh, it's a wee video, but it doesn't seem to be giving me the opportunity to play it. And this, uh, if we can get this to go, this will back up the relationships thing and the communication. Ah, down the bottom there, maybe. Oh no, it's just a PowerPoint. Okay, go with this. Okay. Ian Wright's coming. Yeah. This is about the relationships thing and about how you talk to people and how you communicate with them. We had 90-ish applications this year. And the 90-ish applications, we interview them all and they go through an assessment centre and we made a selection. When we were saying to the young people who came along with their carers, what, what's making you disengaged from school? No, we didn't say that. We said things like, why are you not going to school very much? They didn't say to us, the curriculum doesn't meet my needs and aspirations. <laughs> Generally speaking, the answer was made out of two words. The first is a definite article, the. The second word was teachers. The teachers. Not all the teachers, but some of the teachers. And it was about how they were treated by the teachers. How the teachers spoke to them. <coughs> how the teachers interacted with them or didn't, the way in which the teachers didn't listen to them. And it would start off with them not going to that lesson and taking that afternoon off secondary school again. And then it would go, ah, what's the point? We'll just take a day off. And then they just 
drift away. And something that this country needs to address, and I say this every time I'm out now, is the way that some of the folk in our profession treat young people and talk to them. Before I left Gov Before I left Govan, for years we had a no shouting rule. Not for the Wayans, but for the teachers. No shouting away. Ian's still the highest scoring striker ever to play for Arsenal, right, and he owes a lot one. to the man who first taught him to kick a ball. His old school teacher, Sid Pigden. As I haven't seen him for what 23, 24 years, um, so he would now be expecting me to be six feet under, I would think. I, I don't actually think, uh, uh, he, he probably won't recognise me because he won't believe it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello Ian, long time no see. Mr Pigden, <laughs> <laughs> you're alive. <laughs> I'm alive, he says. How are you doing? I can't believe it, someone said you was dead. And as you see, I'm very much in, and I'm so glad you've done so well with yourself. He was so um, supportive all the time. He, he, he kind of like had me as, as his kind of like special guy. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You know, now I realise how important he was in my life. The first main imposing figure, male figure in my life, who was trying to guide me on the, the right road. How far are we going back now? 40 years, 30 yeah. years easy, anyway. Easy, 30, 30 odd, 32 years. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see if you can get me that previous one where we're talking about this? Right, folks, what we're picking up from, in the context of what I've been talking about, the first picking up real that, positive um, Just show male. Up. In my in my life, and he's a, he's a, he's a teacher called Mr. Pigden, and, and power of that relationship. Anything else? Somebody who believed in him, yeah. To Sorry? To Takes one person. Yep. Magic. Yeah. Anything else? And many of us understand that, don't we? Did I have mutual respect up there earlier on? I think we'd with that in bucket loads. Didn't we? Absolute, uh, absolute bucket loads. Now, this afternoon, my wife wasn't working today. She was in the house and we achieved the impossible. We got a joiner in to fix a cupboard that was beyond my DIY skills. The joiner called Graham Wiley. And I heard the name, it was through Gail's dad's pal that we got. This guy said, Graham Wiley. It was a cream oil and cow denouse, that was the first school I worked in. So anyway, the joiner's in, he's talking to Gail, and lo and behold, it was the same Graham Wiley. He's now 52 or something. He's worked as a joiner all his years, took his early retirement out of River Clyde Holmes, and he's now working for himself. And he said, oh yeah, he said, I remember Ian. He said, uh, he was one of the better guys. Now see if you get that kind of testimonial that tells you everything about now you may or may not believe that I believe it the creativity and leadership doesn't sit with the way our national education system works now I can say that because I believe it that's my belief I've got loads of experience I've worked in different places, and I can say that. And nobody is going to discipline me or sack me for saying it either. Leadership style.
I sometimes say, I can go gallivanting here and there. And I wonder sometimes if you even miss me. When the work of the best leader is done, we did it ourselves. Pupil voice. Vocational courses. Talk to young people about what the vocational courses are this session. Any observations? How's our nature child care? Which being trans translated as, why is there not a vocational option in child care? What do you think happened? Of course we did. The yearbook. David commented on the yearbook. Jim Biggin, who is our facilities guy, drives the minibus, has wisdom and practical things that I couldn't even begin to comprehend. Jim says, I think we should have a yearbook here. And I said, what do you mean by a yearbook? He said, something that we'd all put something into, every single person in the place, and that everybody's bit would have equal weight. He said, but see if we do this, we've got to do it right, we've got to do it properly published, we'll get uh, Glasgow Creative to work on it. Formal staff meeting every week. I said, bring it on Wednesday, Jim. So he brought it. That's a great idea, Jim. If we're looking at a hierarchy, traditionally, in Newlands Junior College, not that I've subscribed to this, but people would identify him as being at the bottom of the hierarchy. Jim Biggin. Without a single minute's qualification in teaching, put together that yearbook, and it's quite something, isn't it, David? And lastly, the timetable. <coughs> When we went at first, I was saying that the guys had recruited, you know, we can do anything here. In terms of organising how we deliver, we can do anything, anything goes. But what they were comfortable with was year one, which we only had at a time, two classes, one doing maths at that time, while they were doing maths, they were doing English. Then they swapped from English and maths, and then it's IT and science, science and IT, fine. So this all works through, and we're through the whole first year, and we're getting to around about February in the second year. And the old differential progress has seriously kicked in. And we're sitting at one of these morning topics, uh, morning uh, discussion, and the topic come up, you know, I've got so-and-so, and he's nearly finished maths. I've got so-and-so who's weeks behind. See if I could get her for a concentrated period of time. And him just for a wee while get finished. And then Kenny says, ah, oh, it's different than science. So they all started to talk and I'm thinking, oh, oh we're getting somewhere now. So I'm saying, what are, you, what are you talking about? How are you seeing this? Well, we need to change things. And what they come up with was that instead of being sent five times a week to English, five times a month, the Waynes get told in advance who's available. So they come in and say, right, I'm going to maths. I can go to maths or science or personal development at that time. So they pick where they go. Seriously, we do. And we've got a system of advisors that overlooks this so that they all get to the end point. Well, we saw the results. This year, we didn't start it in the February with year twos. We started it right at the beginning of year twos. We haven't done it with the year ones as yet because the team aren't just too comfortable with that. I knew that this could happen way back at the start, but I was willing to wait a year and a half because it's got to come from the right place. So you nurture it. Eh, uh, jargon bottom up, I think. Back to Tom Peters again. Is that no curriculum for excellence? <coughs> Somebody should. You ever heard that in a staff room? Somebody should. I remember once in Govan with an attempted break in in the music department and try to get into the strong room. There was all sorts of plaster knocked off the ball, but instead I'd been plastered ball, they found out it was brick, so they couldn't get into the musical instruments. What a shame. So there's this pile of, and it's only plaster lying in the corridor. So I went back along to Janice and said, uh, when are we going to get that swept up, Davey? He said, oh, I've, I've sent uh, for the folk from Bilton to come and do it. I said, give me a brush and shovel. He said, what? I said, give me a... Come on! Give me it! Of course he didn't, but he learned a lesson. He went, I'm responsible, you see that? If I 
I'm walking along the corridor in Graven High and see a Chris poke. I go and walk right round the school and say the day cleaners a Chris poke down in the PE corridor. I pick it up and put it in the bin. I'm responsible. That's ah, not my job. I'm responsible. Now, Giuliani said that and he had it on his desk. He didn't believe that he was responsible in the sense that he could do everything in New York City. He knew that he had the ultimate responsibility, but what he needed was for folk to all do their own bit. And I just love that. <coughs> and this is all no easy. Risky and messy. Have a wee read of that. It's a cracker. And finally, this is the one that I'm going to read to you because it's me. It's this motorcycle journalist, but it's me. Life's not a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in one pretty and well-preserved piece. But to skid across the line, broadside, thoroughly used up, worn out, leaking out oil and shouting, Geronimo! <laughs> And it had a brilliant song and dance, but it had a brilliant song and dance, but I thought it would have worked. Okay, I, I don't usually do that. I don't usually do that. But I am going to give a big compliment to Edinburgh as a local authority. Because after all the comments that, that Ian's made about the system and about local authority, I think it's important to recognise that we had you here. Absolutely. We here tonight, and we opened this up to this group. Not because we don't want to make a difference here, but because we do. And one of the things that I always credit, and I think it's important to credit, and everybody should recognise it, is that there is always someone at David's level or above who comes along and shares in these conversations. And that's really, really important. And the other thing that I would want to say now that I've switched the mic on, <laughs> so YouTube has lost a lot. Apology for Edinburgh Council. <laughs> One of the other things that I would say is that we've got Gillian Hunt here with us. Gillian, go and stand up and let people see your new glamorous haircut, <laughs> <laughs> which I find particularly fetching, I have to say. Um, <laughs> and Gillian's actually been working within Edinburgh to try and set up some similar model to Newlands Junior College in a different way. way. And I think it's encouraging as well, Ian, that rather than find doors closed, you find doors open. And you've got a meeting, I think, tomorrow. A week tomorrow. A week tomorrow. Time just flies by in my life. Um, um, got a meeting with Andy Gray, the, the man that couldn't be here tonight. I thought that was lovely, by the way, David, when you when you said that. You, know, you said that Andy Gray's not here tonight, and everybody looked at you and went, shit, he's got the sack. <laughs> so there you go. Um, you know, next one to go. And then you explained why he wasn't here, so that was good. We can edit that bit, David, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody needs to hear the expletive. But I think it's important. Gillian, do you want to just say a wee bit about the broad general idea that you've got for this model? I was, I was really using Newlands as, as my inspiration, having been there to visit. French society, by the way. Just before you go. Um, I went to visit Newlands Junior College. I've known Ian for some time. Um, I think it was last November that we went. Um, and I took voluntary redundancy in March last year. And I've been spending my time going out and speaking to hundreds of people. People in Edinburgh, I've been in speaking to Alistair Gaw, I've been speaking to businesses. I have a meeting a week on Friday with Fiona Robertson from Scottish Government. Um, I have a business in Edinburgh that is interested to help to underwrite this. Um, and I'm currently working with Ian and Jim in the West where we are writing a paper about the future funding model that we're hoping to get to encourage this kind of development so that we can not replicate exactly what Newlands is but to look at what we might want in our own areas. And I've been speaking to people in the arts so that we're looking at not just STEM in Edinburgh but STEAM. I don't know if you we were talking about that at the last. Um, creative conversation, so the arts is part of it. I have a number of businesses that are interested. Edinburgh College is interested in working with us on this. So it's really exciting, and I think that Ian's right in the things he's been talking about, saying, going out and being brave and asking the questions. And I've been in a really privileged position in the last nine months of taking redundancy and having the time to go and speak to people. Um, it's been hugely exciting and I'm, I've made some connections today and I'm, there's people that I've already invited myself to go and speak to them. So I'd love to speak to other people if there are people who'd like to invite me to come and talk to them. Um, 
and onwards and upwards. Absolutely. And what I was really keen to do with that was just to open up the idea that regardless whether you're from a primary school or whether you're from a special school or a secondary school, the important thing is to say what's in it for us, potentially what's in it for us and our children. What is there in that model that Gillian's trying to work with others to bring in in Edinburgh and as I say encountering open doors rather than shut ones? And we need to keep this dialogue going because there are young people within Edinburgh who would benefit from an extension in terms of the provision that they've got regardless of what age or stage they're at. So I just wanted to do that kind of apology bit. Um, what about questions? Anything anybody wants to ask Ian? <laughs> Are you fear? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious, when you've got kind of such high demand for places uh, that it's effectively kind of one in three can get a place, how do you decide which one in three that is? Right, okay. First of all, uh, there's a kind of, uh, before the interview troll, and that takes us on to Facebook and to look at what young people have got in the Facebook pages, and basically you don't get an interview if you're standing on a Facebook page with a machete, just the way it is. And folk have said to us, well, that's a bit unreasonable, and invading their private space. And we've said, well, that's what companies do nowadays. And see, the private bits of Facebook don't think for a minute that companies don't employ people that get into that. I don't use Facebook at all. Because it terrifies me. So there's, there's the first stage. Second stage is they come with carer, parent, whatever, and they meet a couple of us and we have a chat. And uh, we try to suss out just exactly what kind of uh, understanding, if you like, they, they have of uh, what it's about. We start to explore uh, why they've been disengaging. That's when we're getting the, uh, the teacher stuff, uh, sadly, so much. And after that, there is what we call uh, an assessment centre. And they come along and... They do activities, problem solving activities, getting to know you, activities, um, whist, I'm going to say this, but they do assessments to see where they're at and things like science and literacy and uh, numeracy. And uh, assessments, all right, it's what you do with the results that becomes a problem. That's my view anyway. Um, so we do all of that. We have folk from our partner organisations, uh, the colleges and whatnot, they're in and they're observing and taking part as well. And then you know what the wonderful thing is? It's no measurable, it's no empirical. What happens is people sit around and say, what about David Carmer? What are we thinking of him? Has he got the right stuff? Is he going to make it? And then they get graded, sadly, but it's reality and uh, uh, definites, maybe it's in no chances and uh, from that, we come to the scholarship offers. Um, it's been interesting when uh, we've been confirming success in scholarship offers. The reaction of uh, some of the parents has been uh, it's been heartbreaking because and the, the grannies because they are breaking their heart when they hear they are uh, so emotional about the whole thing about uh, the opportunity. So that's uh, that's how we do it, and it's trying to do things better, we're not happy with what we're doing and we're looking this year, what we're floating out to our partner schools is we're floating out uh, the idea of in the summer term a four day block maybe where we have maybe 40, 45 young people in and they go through that selection process now somebody's going to ask and we do think about this, what about the young people that don't make it First thing is, we'll give feedback when requested and we will talk the young person through what, uh, what the reasons have been and the bottom line in all of this is we've only got 30 places so we need to try and get this as uh, right as we can. Somebody challenged me a bit about this, uh, it was a gathering like this and they said we were kind of hinting it was a bit of an outrage that we were treating the unsuccessful candidates. I said, uh, I think actually you should be asking the local authority about that and know me. Because these young people are coming from a, something that's not working for them. And we 
decide that we won't work for them either because it'll not work for everybody and it doesn't work for everybody sometimes and we find it in this session we got a phone call in from a mommy saying she's no coming back and this is somebody that we think is doing fine sadly what follows that is and I can't even make her what happens there in Pacific Institute terms is that we've got them moving towards a new David Cameron or a new Ian White but there's a big elastic, strong elastic dragging them back to the old one and some of them between themselves and their families don't have the resilience to keep going forward and it's a shame it's a shame so the selection is not easy <coughs> Thank you. I was um, been thinking about what you said about um, Scottish teachers and the education system and conformity and uniformity and it was making me laugh. A colleague said um, yesterday in the staff room, he said, you know, you could bring an alien to the staff room and they would know that we were in a school. Like, why, what do you mean? And he said, well, look at the microwave. And beside the microwave, there's about six plastic cups with lids all different colours of soup all waiting to be heated up in the microwave. So when you're kind of in that sort of ingrained system and it sometimes feels a wee bit like Stockholm Syndrome, what, how, can you, how can you take that first step to kind of be brave and, and you know, um, put yourself out there? Well, somebody once said, uh, and I read a lot and I go to a lot of these business gurus, but I think it was Tom Peters again. He said, you know, change happens when folk get pissed off. <laughs> so if you're in that situation, can you find a like-minded soul that's equally this? Because great things happen when folk get together. And then that's when the bravery comes in. You've got to be brave enough to say, now if you're not the head teacher, you've got to be brave enough to go in. Something I'd like to talk to you about. We could be doing this better. What we did in Govan, see when we did these curriculum conferences, I managed to get the whole senior management team onto the, um, oh, what was its name again? The head teachers programme. That was oh, done. No, before that. Columba, yeah. Columba 1400. It was the leadership program. And I managed to get every, and we got a lot of training in non directive coaching. So, what we did was, with all these conferences, we drew it together and we got a kind of master plan of where we're going. And then we gave every single member of staff, every single member of staff, teachers and support staff, the opportunity to come to a member of the leadership team who'd been trained in non-directive coaching. And the 20 minute session, the topic was my place in the brave new world. Some of the folk came and spoke to us and worked out that actually they didn't have a place in the brave new world. So we only had a wee school, 33 teachers or something like that. Within a year, seven of them had left who identified in it, were not bad people. They just didn't buy into this new concept. Two didn't leave, who should have? <laughs> and at that time, Ronnie O'Connor, the director in Glasgow, um, he had been right, he loved this, he was right in amongst this, David, you know, all, all these developments. And he'd be out talking to us at this time of day with sleeves rolled up, saying, oh, guys. I said, right, Ronnie, we've got this situation here, what are we doing? He said, I think, Ian, we're required to manage these people rigorously. <laughs> Which is what we did. And a wee while later, they left under different uh, circumstances as well. But the change has got to start somewhere. Remember what I was saying? John F. Kennedy changed the world. Mosquito. Values. Beliefs. It's all very well for him to say that, isn't it? Yeah, and do you know another thing? That you need to see his debut. Um, and... I think this is a really important point because I do think that one of the things is that when you listen to Ian, he's, he's so out there and in your face and he can't spell apology. I mean, I'm sure if he did something really outrageously wrong or let a child down, he'd be the very first to say sorry. But he is utterly unapologetic in his delivery. 
and he's so in your face both in terms of style and everything else there's a danger that the people you want to move forward and stop putting their cups in a row by the microwave just think I could never be that and I think sometimes the trick is to do what he does and let them see people who've come out in, and been themselves I mean if you don't mind the in, in Govan High School, they had a librarian, and the librarian would, I mean, he was just the oddest wee man in lots of ways. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this. And he had the biggest comb over since Bobby Charlton. I mean, he made Rabsy Nesbitt look as if he had an afro. And he wore his coat, but I always remember one of his classic quotes to me was he said, he said, I'm not the kind of, sorry, he said, I really like to be well organized. I'm not the kind of person you'll find on the airplane reading the guidebook. <laughs> and he was that kind of guy. He was absolutely at the heart of what they did in Govan High. Absolutely at the heart of it. Because he came forward and he said, these children don't know how to conduct themselves in the library. They don't know. And Ian and his colleagues said to him, so what is it they need to do? And they got him to draw up the list of skills which became the backbone of the curriculum in Govan High School. And it's that lesson, it's seeing somebody like that wee guy, that wee librarian, who in a sense would have been in the microwave, far less setting his cup up beside it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's letting people see guys like that who've moved from where they are to, to be a part of that wider change. And I think that's one of the things that people need to see. And it's the whole idea, I mean, one of the things I would say to you is get yourself to teach you know, get your staff to engage with Pedigo, get them to go along, get them to see people who are doing a job and doing it well. Um, get them to see people who do one thing right. You know, I think some of the time that what we do too often is we get people to stand up and talk about who they are. And Ian actually manages to do both. Ian manages to talk about who he is, but he also talks about what he did. That's what your staff need. They just need these wee hoops, these wee bits that help them to start to move forward. Alan McLean, sorry, I'll stop shortly. Alan McLean, the educational psychologist guy, has got a brilliant story. Head teacher wanted him to work in, a, in his school. And he came into the school and he was in the staff room. And then he went in to see the head teacher. And the head teacher said to him, when would you like to start? And he said, I'll not be starting here. And he said, why not? He said, I've just been in your staff room. You've got 15 jars of coffee in that staff room. That when you've got one jar of coffee in the staff room, I'll come in and work with your staff. And these are the small transitions. These are the small points that you move forward from. And sometimes it's just about getting to the one jar of coffee as well. Yeah, and it's, it's about that in the leadership position. It's about that facilitate and enable thing. I don't actually do very much frontline um, pioneering of stuff. And I didn't do it in government either. It's the Ian McCranks. And look at what come out of nurturing and encouraging and developing Ian McCrank. You know, and it's about the uh, it's about the uh, maths teacher that we have, uh, uh, Douglas, who has got a passion for history. So he does a wee bit of history now and then for us as well. So again, not GTC register and that <laughs> subject. Uh, he's also got a passion in rugby. These are pretty mainstream down the line. He's the guy that's working with Kia developing the uh, skills taxonomy and the recording and reporting system along with Bob Tennant for Newlands Junior College. He's leading that up. He is leading up the revision to the recruitment process. So what we do in the team is we allow people to express ideas, to show an interest, and then they go with it. Then they run with. Back in the Govan days, with somebody in an acting capacity in uh, the leadership team, and uh, uh, quite funny because he, he wasn't there for very long. But after a wee while, he told somebody in the staff base, and it was amazing. I got to hear most of the stuff that went on. You know? Oh, I'm keeping my mouth shut up now. I'm not saying anything because you come up with an idea there, you only finish up with a load of work you do. 
His idea was he comes up with an idea and he was a somebody shoot guy. So I did it, or somebody else did it. But no, the whole, and I was really fortunate and this was due to the local authority, Strathclyde, Renfrew Division at the time. I get the opportunity from Charlie Knox, remember Charlie, to go to um, Reading for a week along with Sybil Simpson who was the deputy at Linwood and then went to Knightswood as head teacher just before me. We went down to Reading to a training centre that Rank Xerox had there at the time and with a whole bunch of deputy heads from England we got the training that Rank Xerox executives got in total quality management and that was a watershed for me that had me spring forward. And again, what I would urge you to do is read leadership things that have nothing to do with education. Read about Churchill. There's a guy called David Hackworth. There were saner men locked up than David Hackworth. Steal My Soldier's Heart, a book about Vietnam. Absolutely fascinating. Read about Herb Kelleher in South. He was the guy that started Southwest Airlines, the first budget airline in the world. Somebody said to him, how do you keep a handle? How do you know everything that's going on in the organisation? He said, why would I want to know that? Why would I want to know that? Read that stuff. Take the opportunity. I heard the Tom Peters story about colouring outside the lines in Manchester. There was me in the room and 399 business people. And it was a Q&A and I managed to my hand up. I said, hello Tom, I'm Ian, and I'm a teacher. I can't do the American accent, but he says, oh my God, I knew this would happen one day. <laughs> and I said, no, I just want to say, I agree, I understand, I recognise what you're saying there. He was also the guy that said at that, excuse me, that coin how many of you are doing or have an MBA? Oh, in a forest of hands. He said, I urge you, stop right now if you've not completed it. <laughs> he said, do something in the fine arts or the creative arts. Forget the MBA. And he's a dab hand with a photocopier. I'll tell you that, Ryan Zero <laughs> saying, that's really paid off for him. Any other questions that you want to ask now? Uh, right, here we go. Hi, it was just, um, it was obviously, it's amazing to hear about Newlands, and it's really interesting to hear from Gillian that she's thinking about trying to, you know, um, have a similar model in Edinburgh. I was just wondering, in light of the fact that you've only got place for 30 and all the, you know, other kids we feel are maybe missing out, is there any interest on any from anyone to start doing these models more well, across one, the one country? Of, yeah, one of the reasons that Gillian's working with us is on that very thing. We had a meeting the other day, in fact, you've heard enough from me, Gillian. Go on, you go. We're going to um, be looking at gathering some statistics to see how many, how many young people do would need this kind of experience. So how many colleges would we want to start? And I think one of the key things that we've learned from Newlands and that I've been learning going along is it needs to stay small. So it's not a case of saying, right, okay, let's have one in Edinburgh and let's have 200, 300 kids come. It's about keeping it to that small family relationship where those young people belong to the college, the college belongs to them. And let, maybe we need three in Edinburgh. But we're going to look at some of those statistics and that's what we're, we're writing a paper just now to, to put to people to say, look, this is how we could accommodate the, the young people and support schools with these young people. And we've had First Minister's been, Cabinet Secretary for Education's been, the uh, Permanent Secretary, Head Civil Servant in the country's been, uh, Liz Smith, the Tory Education Spokesperson has been, uh, Ruth Davidson's coming on the 30th, Willie Rennie was in the other day. We are working around all sides because they're all saying, this is great, this is brilliant. But you need to, in Glasgow terms, you need to pony up. You need to pony up because we've actually worked out, if you take six and a half thousand a year, it's what it roughly costs in a secondary school across the board. It's 15 grand at Newlands Junior College. You consider we, Tommy Fittori Glen, he gets his six and a half grand for four years in school, 26 grand of public money. Or maybe he doesn't, if he disengages and doesn't keep going. However, Nigel from Newton Mearns gets his four years and then he gets another two. So he is up to six times, six. Now he's up to 39,000 already. Then he goes to the uni and gets another 36. So he's up to 75 grand worth of public money. And Tommy Fittori Glen at best is getting 26,000. 
this is a country where the politicians espouse equality. That's no equality. Jim McCall's point is, right, okay, the money that goes to the schools, six and a half thousand, actually goes with the child. Because what happens is, and I haven't been governed, we used to disengage, but you still get the money. And you spend it on the other means. So that money comes out. So you're six and a half towards the 15. And his point in the government is, you give another six and a half, and the business sector will come in and top that up. And in actual fact, when you start to work it out, which is what we're going to be into, in the grand scheme of things, it's peanuts. But he's also saying, if you're really going for equality, see the guys that are never going to do the six years? Why don't they get a fifth and sixth year money brought forward? People say it's not scalable because it's too expensive. We can't afford not to do this. Because, first of all, there's a human tragedy of wasted talent. And secondly, see if folk that take benefits become taxpayers. See that if they're healthier. See if they're going to get involved in the criminal justice system. All these business folk that I talk to say, this is a no-brainer. In the business world, this is investment for profit. This is a no-brainer. So we actually believe that this is going to happen. And they're trying to get one in Dundee. Yes. Just as an additional wee piece of information and for you. Let, and let me, Edinburgh, yes, great response in Edinburgh. Renfrewshire Council, hugely interested. Um, South Lanarkshire, North Lanarkshire. So um, earlier on, uh, as David was saying, I am the master of hyperbole. <laughs> I think you're overstating that. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close it off in terms of formal questions now.